What's going on all you mentees? Uncanny Omar here from Near Mint Condition. And today I am doing something completely different. Well, not completely. It's still comic book related. 45 years old today. It is my birthday. So I wanted to look at 45 different covers from the last 45 years. Something different, but let's have some fun. Welcome back everybody. So today is my birthday. So I don't want to toot my own horn, but I wanted to do something a little bit different on my birthday. And if you all enjoy these type of videos, maybe I'll do it again next year, 46 years, 46 covers. So I wanted to look at the covers that aren't just iconic or have a historical significance to them, but I wanted to look at the covers that mean a lot to me, whether they're just beautiful covers or whether they're part of the story that I enjoy and always remind me of that or that particular era or when I got it. I don't know. It's just, I'm going to be looking at covers. So this might be kind of boring. I don't know. Uh, but talking a little bit about them and what makes them make this list. So I made it a little bit difficult, a lot bit difficult actually, because you all know, I like to limit myself. So I can only choose one cover from one year. So I was born in 1978, so I can only choose one cover from 1978, 1979, you get the idea. And believe me, this was hard, especially when you get into this iconic era of the 80s that you're like, how do I choose this Daredevil cover over this particular cover from Batman and vice versa? And since I am the Uncanny Omar, there are a couple of X-Men books in here, but I mean, who did not expect that? Before I go any further though, smash that like button, subscribe, ring that bell for notifications. That goes a long way for us here on the channel. So 45 years, 45 covers. Let's go ahead and get started. Kicking it off with 1978, X-Men 114. Now I didn't call it Uncanny X-Men because it wasn't Uncanny X-Men yet. X-Men 114, the day the X-Men died. I remember at a comic book store looking at that cover for so many years and wanting that cover. I don't know what the story was about. I just remember seeing it at a comic book store that was about an hour and a half away from my house uh, when we were living in America. And I was like, what? the X-Men died. Why is Gene pushing Professor X? And they're all mopey and sad. That is the only cover that I also have signed by Stan Lee and John Byrne and Chris Claremont. But it, it's, it's, it's just such a special cover to me. It's not my favorite story. But I just remember from my childhood, that was the cover that I always wanted in my collection and still have it to this day. 1979 brings us Micronauts number nine. That cover is by Michael Golden. And the reason I chose this cover was because, again, part of my childhood was growing up reading about these particular characters. And oh my gosh, these characters just surrounded by all of these different villains. That is such an awesome series. If you haven't had the chance to read it, more than likely, if you're into collected editions, sadly, they're not available in collected editions because of licensing. But you have Marionette, Acro Year, Bug there, Biotron, uh, Ran there. And only really one that's missing is Karza. But that was a lot of my childhood. And then the reason I got into Micronauts was because of the X-Men versus Micronauts miniseries. So I started collecting Micronauts as a kid because I thought they were related to the X-Men. Not at all. They were their own toy line. New Teen Titans number one takes our 1980 spot. Of course, I had to throw a George Paytas cover in here. And what better cover to kick it off than the cover introducing us to the new Teen Titans lineup. Now, of course, we've had established characters like Robin in there and Kid Flash and Donna Troy, Wonder Girl. But we also had new uh, Changeling, uh, new characters there like Raven and Cyborg. So Starfire, of course, I had to add it in there. Raven in the background, just kind of hovering above everybody. That is such an awesome cover to me. It's one that they've used for many collections, like the Omnibus Editions, but absolutely 100%, 1980, that's the cover. I said this is an, all going to be an Uncanny X-Men list, but I have to put it in there. I mean, is there is there another cover that has been, like, tributed to or, or has, been, ha has had so many homages to than Uncanny X-Men 41? Now, this is when they're going in from X-Men to Uncanny X-Men. And 
That John Byrne cover, oh my gosh, it's so perfect. It's so great. What does it mean? Why is there an old Wolverine? Who's hunting these mutants? Whoa, some of my favorite characters are dead. What's happening? Some of them are wanted. You know, to look at that cover and imagine being a kid and not knowing, not having the internet and not knowing exactly what's happening and only hearing about it later on in different stories and then getting the chance to actually own it and 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 having it in your collection oh man i love that love that cover 1982 brings us gi joe 6 this is the marvel comic gi joe 6 the covers by mike bosberg i love that cover as a kid gi joe was my childhood whether it was the cartoon or whether it was the comic book and people are divided with Cobra Commander. Some people like the hooded look. This was my favorite mask that he had. And some people like the post movie look to him. No way. That right there. That just blank mask that reflects the enemy on it. Oh, I love that look for Cobra Commander. Now, Thor 337 has to represent the year 1983. Come on. The introduction of Beta Ray Bill just smashing his way, not just through that cover or the corner box, but the title. Who is this horse dude that is wielding Mjolnir? What, what is this about? Walter Simonson just kicking all kinds of ass on that title. Oh my gosh. And coming in strong, swinging. Maybe that's where the term came in, came from the coming in swinging strong. No, probably not. But anyway, oh my gosh, absolutely. Yes, that cover is so iconic. It's so beautiful. Some of the covers you're going to see in here are going to be iconic and some of them are going to be like, what? Wow, there's a lot of good covers coming. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1. Oh man, that cover is so awesome. As a kid, I knew one of my friends that had this comic book. I had issue number four because Ninja Turtles was this hidden secret, this hush hush in the, in not just for like the kids, but the comic book people, because it was an independent comic that came out. It had a limited print run. I mean, it, it was like 500 or so. And I remember my friend Jason having a copy of the first one. His dad found it for him because his dad was also a comic book collector. And his dad said, keep it safe, you know, keep it in a little bag and board and I was like, why, dude, you got to read it. I remember seeing that cover at his house. We couldn't open it up because even though it was his, it was behind some cupboard or something that his grandmother gave him in his room and looking at it and, and thinking that is amazing. Now, I didn't even know about this series until the cartoon. So this must have been 1988, 1989 when no, 88, 88, when I was at Jason's house looking at that cover because that issue came out in 1984. But I love the, the the color tones and just these four turtles that started off as a joke just standing on top of a building. So awesome. Crisis on Infinite Earth 7. What a powerful cover. My first comic book, my first DC comic was Crisis on Infinite Earths 8. 7 is just perfection. Oh my gosh. That, that cover, that so much pain and anguish. George Paytas, man, just knew how to draw and, and, and knew how to draw multiple characters in the background. I don't think we've come close. Okay, we've come close with artists. You know, there's several artists that, that can draw multiple characters on one page, but he was on another level. Oh my gosh, was he in another level, man. Rest in peace. Ah. Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Another so yes, a lot of these are iconic covers, of course. That is such an awesome cover. The lightning in the background. You don't really get to see Batman. You, you can see that he's a bigger, chunkier, not chunkier is the wrong word to use there. More muscular Batman. What a freaking awesome cover. What a cover to make you go and buy this book. Even if you weren't reading Batman at the time. That is a one phenomenal color uh, cover by Frank Miller. Web of Spider-Man 32. This is a cover by Mike Zek, who was drawing the series at the time. This is all, of course, the uh, Craven's Last Hunt storyline. But that image as a kid, and to this day still stays, of Spider-Man just coming out of his own grave. Like, that is so dark. So freaking awesome. A man that does not give up. Even being buried alive, he just rips out of the ground. Oh, what an awesome image. And there are a lot of images from these years, but that's the one that I had to go for. 
Batman the Killing Joke. Brian Boland's artwork in this book is just phenomenal, but that cover, that cover is so perfect. Because it doesn't really tell you what the story is about. You don't know if you're going to read the Joker's origin, the Joker's last story. Is it? Does it even feature Batman in here? It doesn't tell you much, but it intrigues you and it lures you in. And that big, creepy smile. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. Uncanny X-Men 251. That cover. Oh my gosh, that cover is perfection. Mark Silvestri, Wolverine, hanging on a cross like that. You, know, it, you don't even need to read the story. It's just you know that Wolverine somehow has been beaten. This is one of the most ferocious X-Men has been beaten and hung up on a cross as a symbol. Who would do this? Well, I mean, if you read the comics, you know. By the way, there might be spoilers in here. I forgot to mention that. I won't go too heavy into spoilers because they're covers. But yeah, somebody hung up Wolverine. Who was it? And who's going to pull him down? Could a young little firecracker pull him down? Spider-Man number one. Spider-Man number one was the best-selling comic book of all time. Until, of course, we got X-Force and then X-Men. But Spider-Man number one. And that cover by Todd McFarlane. I love the webbing. Uh, Spider-Man uh, Spider was changed a lot by Todd McFarlane. And I realize that there are people that are purists when it comes to Spider-Man, that they like the old Silver Age Steve Ditko look, or John Romita Jr., or John Romita Sr., sorry. Oh, even Jr. And don't really like this 90s look to Spider-Man. But that 90s look to Spider-Man was my childhood. I remember the webbing. I remember the spaghetti webbing that we named it. I don't know who con, uh, who actually came up with that term but i remember talking about it in school how that changed the game how he gave him bigger eye you know the 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 mask became had bigger eye holes not eye holes the eyes on his mask were bigger the the proportions of spider-man the, the ridiculous poses everything was so different and i love this cover now there was like a gray or silver gold and then the first printing but I had to go with that cover. And then later on, he came back and did issue number 13 in homage to him, himself. X-Men number one. Is there a better gatefold cover than the deluxe edition of X-Men number one? Or putting all four covers of Magneto and the rest of the X-Men together? Jim Lee. Oh my gosh, Jim Lee. This, this guy... I remember everybody wanting to... As, as a kid, everybody wanting to draw like Jim Lee. And this right here is the personification as to why everybody wanted to draw like Jim Lee. This is 1991, and X-Men was relaunched with a brand new number one, best-selling comic book of all time. And I'm sure Jim Lee had a lot to do with that. And of course, Chris Claremont. It was, and actually, it was Chris Claremont's last hurrah before he ended up leaving the book. But yeah, oh man, that cover. I love that cover, that connecting cover, the deluxe covers, or all four covers together to form that beautiful image. Magneto just looking so fierce. Oh, man. Um, I could talk about the whole episode about that one. Spawn number one. Oh, yeah. The design on Spawn, another Todd McFarlane. I didn't know I had Todd McFarlane, like, almost back to back. This, that's 1992. Didn't care what the story was about. Just looked at that cover and said, yep. I'm going to get it because at that time, you know, some of us were like, oh, these these guys are making their own company. It was still it was before the age of the Internet. So we didn't know as kids like what was happening to Tom McFarlane, Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri, uh, Jim Valentino, Rob Liefeld, Wills Portacio, Eric Larson. All we knew was they were leaving comics and they were going to start their own comic book. We didn't know it was a company. Some of it had something to do with Malibu. So we thought, well, maybe like it's still Marvel. Yeah, it was the unknown. And that, to me, was the, the independent comic book and all the image comics, of course, like everyone my age in the 90s, because that was my senior year, eighth grade, senior year. Those were the books we were getting. And for the first time, we were buying independent comics. You know, everybody was talking about Cerebus or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but those were out of our reach. For some reason, when Image came on board, it was so much easier to get comic book stores pharmacies were getting them so yeah pharmacies and grocery stores wonder woman 72 oh my gosh brian boland's covers on william messner Loeb's wonder woman was they were all great but that that one right there they actually made a statue of this one 
it's such a beautiful pose and what a stance and you could tell she's a warrior woman oh my gosh what a gorgeous piece absolutely stunning drop dead gorgeous and a badass at the same time my goodness wonder woman green lantern number 49 takes the slot of 1994 and that's a cover by daryl banks and you don't even know what's happening why does hal jordan look crazy he's got this creepy smile he's holding all these green lantern rings what has he done oh my gosh emerald twilight while a lot of the older people that were reading because i was at a comic book store at this time volunteering not working yet i was working the next year <laughs> they were so pissed they were like, how could they do this to Hal Jordan? This spits in the face of all the fans that have been reading Green Lantern and Hal Jordan for years. But to me, as a sort of newcomer to Green Lantern, only have read uh, the Emerald Dawn series, 1 through 6, and then Emerald Dawn 2, and then a couple of his ongoing series, unless it crossed over, this was a huge game changer. I wanted to know why he was holding these rings. So I had to get issue 48, and then, of course, issue 50, the Glow in the Dark cover. Oh. But the issue 49, I saw some uh, cosplayer at a convention walking around with those rings. And I was like, that is so perfect. Whew, man. Preacher number one. And I had to go with the first issue. That image by Glenn Fabry. Oh, wow. So none of us really knew what Preacher was going to be about. It was We knew it was going to be Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon. And all we had was this image of this yeah, priest looking at a church and it looks like he's burning or maybe he's burning down the church. What exactly is happening? I remember this is when I was working at the comic book store. I remember somebody returning preacher and ripping it in front of me because it was very blasphemous. It's very controversial. And I hadn't read it yet. So after after he did that, I went to get a copy off the stands and I read it. And I was I was hooked. It's not for everybody, and I respect that. I respect people's opinion when it comes to reading books. Some people can't read books that where kids get hurt, animals get hurt. It's got any kind of thing uh, towards Christianity. Uh, so I, I get it. I respect that. Um, but for me, I it's it's one of my favorite Vertigo series of all time, and that cover is wow. It's crazy. All his covers were great. And I had no idea until recently that he was doing a lot of stuff for the 2000 AD uh, Judge Dredd books, too. Wow, we're going to go from Preacher to Uncle Scrooge. Don Rosa. Oh, my gosh. How do I choose a Don Rosa book? This one here is the one that means the most to me. This is Uncle Scrooge Adventures, uh, issue number three from 1996. This is the one that one of my comic book uh, one of the people I sold comics to when I was working at the comic book store lent me because I always wanted to know what is the deal with Scrooge McDuck. He used to get like all of these Marvel and DC comics, a lot of independent stuff. And then I would ask, what's the deal with the duck comics? Because in my head, like a lot of foolish people, I immediately thought they were kids comics. And I remember him looking at me saying, son, you've never read an Uncle Scrooge comic. And he let me borrow... A bunch of books but the ones that stood out to me were of course life and times of scrooge mcduck and that cover right there you know i had watched a little bit of ducktales so i remember those particular um episode well, maybe it's one episode but just seeing scrooge with that golden big golden nugget i i thought of adventure and that really maybe because of the title probably that really symbolizes what the duck comics are to me were these amazing adventures and i get to live through scrooge mcduck oh man wow okay we just went from preacher to scrooge now we're going to berserk berserk 13. now i went with berserk 13 by the way this is the original tonkaban release of the manga in japan. japan so not the american release that cover of Guts and Casca. Holy crap. Having watched 
the anime from 1997. I knew what was what this cover was. I knew what was going to happen. Now, if you're thinking, oh, man, look, it's a barbarian, super sexy time. No, no, no. That cover symbolizes a lot, a lot more and a lot worse than what you think. What you ever could possibly think this book is about, you have no idea. You have no idea what you're in for. And of course, it's being censored because, well, you know. But that cover just symbolizes everything. Never get, no matter how darkest your days get, you never give up and you keep moving forward. Man, what a Miura, rest in, God bless, Kintaro Miura too, rest in peace. Ah, so many legends gone. Battle Chasers, number one, but I went with the Red Monica cover. I was coming back to, I had left comics in 1996. Thank you, Onslaught. And I came back in 2002, 2003 is really when I came back. And one of the things I did was go back and get a bunch of comics that I remember missing out on. One of the ones I was most excited for that I kept hearing people talk about, even though I was out of comics and I was like, ah, la, 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 was Battle Chasers. Is it over? No. Was it good? Eh, it was okay. Was the artwork great? Oh my gosh. If you're a fan of anime and video games, Japanimation as we called it at the time, this was the artist for you. Joe Matt, and how unfair because he was 16 when he started drawing comics, 18 when he was the full-time artist on Uncanny X-Men. What a freaking dream. And then he started doing his own titles and Battle Chasers was one of them. Red Monica cover, I mean, why not? That cover is, whew. I don't even know what the comic's about. I'm buying that comic. I think that is the cover that I did end up owning, though. Wildcats number one. Now, this isn't the original Wildcats. As a matter of fact, I think this is the third version of Wildcats, if I'm not mistaken. But I went with the cover by Travis Charest. Oh, that is a guy I remember in the 90s was one of these artists that wanted to be Jim Lee, like wanted to be a Jim Lee clone. And he started developing his own style. And I remember him drawing Dark Stars. He did a little annual on Hulk. He did a bunch of covers for Batman. I remember he was very Jim Lee-ish. By the time I came back to comics and I went to check out some books that I missed out on, including Alan Moore's run on Wildcats and this Wildcats version, whoa, has his heart changed. And to me, he surpassed that level of wanting to be Jim Lee and he moved on somewhere else. Now he's a little bit of a slow artist, but oh, Wow, his covers, man, they just lure you in. And I had to go with that cover. That cover is so awesome with Grifter and Spartan there. You you still have Warblade and Zealot, of course, some of the original characters, but just that Grifter look. Grifter alone on that cover would have sold me. That cover is freaking awesome. Now for the year 2000, I'm going with Punisher number six. Now it was really difficult to choose a Punisher cover by Tim Bradstreet. But I had to go with Punisher number six. I love that the skulls in the background still. It's his newer symbol whenever they change the skull up a little bit. But now this doesn't really show exactly what the inside is, right? Because this is Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon, the same people that work on Preacher, coming to work on Punisher. This is the Marvel Knights era of Punisher. So it's a little more adultish, a little more maturish. But that freaking cover, oh, that, that lured me in. I was in, dude. Detective Comics number 761 takes our 2001 or my 2001 spot. This is by Dave Johnson. And this I chose because it reminded me of the Batman animated series. And I was a big fan of the Batman animated series. As a matter of fact, I think it's supposed to. But Dave Johnson's artwork, his use of just colors and contrast, it's just amazing. And the lack of colors really helped this out. I mean, if you look at it, it's just black and white with some gray tone, with a gray tone, and then, or gray tones, rather, is too. And then that crimson sky. Holy crap, that speaks volumes. That is a beautiful Batman cover. Uh, this is during Greg Rucka's time on Batman, but that cover is what lured me to pick it up. Now, we have another Batman book, but it's a little bit different. Well, it's a lot bit different. This is Batman 608. The beginning of the Hush Saga, and oh, I, I had to go with the variant cover now. 
It's the one where he's standing on the side on, on a gargoyle because by now we're starting to get variant covers a lot more. I know we had a lot of variant covers in the 90s, but with this, yeah, not a lot of variant covers for DC and Marvel at the time. They stopped doing variants for a while, but they're bringing them back a little bit here in the early aughts, and this is no exception. I love that cover. Now, the original cover of him swinging and kicking, that's a cool cover. You get the boot to your face, but this... Him just standing, just, just standing so majestic on top of that gargoyle. Oh my gosh. Jim Lee and Scott Williams. What a freaking combo. And they've always been a great freaking combo. Street Fighter number one. This is the variant cover by Joe Chen. And this is one of the few times that I remember thinking, oh wow, those prismatic covers actually work on me. This is the Chun Li cover. Oh. Gosh, I love Joe Chen's artwork. She went over, and it's the reason why I picked up a lot of the Buffy issues too. She is a wonderful cover artist, and I would love to have seen a lot more of her internal artwork, but I have to go with Chun Li's. I'm a big fan of Street Fighter, big fan of Udon comics, and Chun Li was my main. Walking Dead number five. So there's a lot of great Walking Dead covers, iconic covers, but I like this one. This is the first Walking Dead single issue I picked up. Just because of the snow and the characters and, and like being surrounded by zombies, what exactly is going on? This was a series that I knew the guy from Kentucky was writing, but I didn't know much about it. My buddy Chris was big into the series since issue number one, and I picked up issue number five based on his recommendation. And then immediately after that, they announced they were coming out with a trade paperback. So, yeah, Walking Dead. That is an awesome Tony Moore image. JSA Classified number one. The Adam Hughes cover. Why would I choose any other cover? Now, I know Amanda Connor did the internal artwork because she was the writer on the book, but that cover of Power Girl just flying down. I assume she's flying down. Maybe it's just my wishful thinking that she's flying down towards me. What, what else can I say? Next. What else can I say? Fables 1001 Nights of Snowfall. Now, I believe this still holds the record, please correct me if I'm wrong, as a cover piece, the original cover piece by James Jean sold for a record-breaking amount of money. Like, it's the most expensive cover ever sold of a comic book. And James Jean did a lot of wonderful artwork for all the cover, most of the covers of Fables. And this one was always my favorite. I love this one shot. It came out in hardcover, but that cover was perfection. He is such a talented artist. And if you haven't read Fables, do yourself a favor and read it. Captain America number 25. The Steve Epstein cover. I know there were variants at the time, but that Steve Epstein cover just wow. It's Captain America's hand with blood on it and he's handcuffed why is he handcuffed you know it, there's a newspaper article there it's part of a civil war epilogue whether you were reading civil war or not that cover really grasped you and pulled you in and i mean that's what covers are supposed to do why the last man number 60. uh the reason i went with this cover this is by massimo carnevale and it's the final issue the cover really doesn't spoil anything but that story means so much to my wife and I that right before we flew to Japan on our honeymoon, we read the final trade paperback and that cover was on the uh, on the back. And I will always remember that cover as the last thing we read right before we got on the plane, flew to Japan because we had to read it together. We read it all in one sitting and we both bawled our eyes out. And that cover means so much to me because if you know the story of Why the Last Man, then that cover means everything how everything comes full circle. Oh, I love it. Day Tripper number one. This is by Fabio Moon and Gabriel Ba, and it is just a freaking awesome story. And holy crap, uh, just it, whether you, you know what the story is about or not, and I've done plenty of overviews of the Absolute Edition. I've talked about the story being one of my favorites. That cover of a man and his dog, and somehow maybe it's an intergalactic thing that he gets pulled through a portal. Doesn't matter. It's a very simplistic cover, but it really catches your eye. And knowing the story, of course, it means a lot. 
But even without knowing the story, I remember seeing that cover at comic book stores and wanting to pick it up. And I'm glad I did. I ended up picking it up, of course, in trade paperback, but I picked it up nonetheless. Batwoman number zero. J.H. Williams artwork on this was phenomenal. And it was really difficult to pick a cover, but I had to go with Batwoman Zero. You've got the bat symbol. It, you, you get to see what he is able to do, how he builds his frames. You see that her arm, her uh, left arm isn't fully colored. It's coming out of the panel. So what does that mean? And oh, wow, he is such a phenomenal artist. And Batwoman, if you've not read it, Greg Rucka kills it, and then when he, he ends up leaving the book, of course, it becomes a like J.H. Williams. But the frames and the panels and the action and just the sequence of events, oh, this is such a beautiful piece of art. The entirety of Batwoman by J.H. Williams. Uh, the second, sorry, I, I just called him J.H. Williams. It must have been his dad. But anyway, th that cover, that cover really symbolizes what Batwoman is. I think other people probably would have chosen a different cover, but to me, that's the one I had to go with, Batwoman Zero. That is a freaking awesome cover. And again, using only white, black, and red, and a couple of different little gray tones. Love it. 2011, we have One Piece 61. And again, I'm going with the original Japanese release date of Ichiro Oda's masterpiece. And if you've been reading One Piece for a long time, this cover means a lot to you because it is an homage to the first tome, the first Tonkabon. And what does it mean? Was there a time jump? Why do the characters look different? Is this in the future? Is this an alternate reality? Oh my gosh, I was so excited to get this volume. Of course, the internet spoiled it for me. I knew what it was about, but I was still excited nonetheless. Wow, we have two manga back to back 2012. One Punch Man. This, I love that cover of the main character just punching through the cover. Well, not through the cover, but punching at the cover. I think it's freaking awesome. Uh, this one here by Yuzuki Murata. And I went again with the original Japanese release. I love this cover. This has been both this and One Piece have now been uh, put uh, brought over here by Viz. So. Both of them are available here, but my gosh, One Punch Man was a freaking treat. Amazing Spider-Man 700. Now I went with the, the, the regular cover, the standard edition cover. This is credited to Mr. Garson. So I don't know if that's a real person or maybe it was a bunch of people that worked in the, the, uh, the, 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 the cover department or not the cover, the art department, but pretty much it's Spider-Man's eye, but if you zoom in close enough, you see that it's made up of a collage of different artists throughout the years. And for the black, they decided to use Venom instead of Spider-Man. That's so cool. Instead of Spider-Man in just the black costume, they decided to use one of his greatest enemies. And I mean, it's everything. It's a black and white art in here. So you see Todd McFarlane, Steve Ditko, Mark Bagley. I'm not going to go through every one of them, I promise. But wow that cover stood out to me because at first glance i thought it was just this mask and then when i got close to it at the comic book store i remember thinking now that that is a cover that is really cool <sighs> man detective comics 37 this is the new 52 era in 2014 with darwin cook's variant cover darwin cook another wonderful artist that cover it's just everything it symbolizes what Alfred is. You know, I've heard Alfred being called just the butler, just his help. Alfred is family. Like, I don't know how people miss that. Alfred is his father figure. Alfred is just everything to Bruce. If there's, I don't, I mean, while he loves, of course, Dick Grayson and Tim Drake and, uh, and Damien and all these characters, I don't think there's a character that he cares more for than Alfred. And I'm probably wrong. You know, you can correct me, of course. But I don't think there's a character out there that he cares for more than Alfred. And that image by Darwin Cook just symbolizes this beautiful relationship between not just Alfred and Bruce, but father and son. And I love that cover. And it's one of the few. Oh, no, he did all of those in landscape covers, I believe, in lands, uh, those covers in that particular year in landscape format. That Teen Titans one was really good, too. 
Tokyo Ghost, uh, Ghost 3. Gosh, I can't even more talk pretty one day. Tokyo Ghost 3. This is by Sean Murphy. I have no idea what the story was about when I saw that cover. I just knew I had to get this book. And I'm glad I, I ended up getting it in trade. And then, of course, in the big hardcover edition. It is coming back out in hardcover edition. Home collected editions. Uh, but I had to get it. Sean Gordon Murphy. Oh, my gosh. I love this artwork. This is the Rick Remender story, by the way. And now Sean Murphy's doing his own thing with the Bat, the White Knight um, stories over at DC Comics. But no idea what this story was about. Definitely anime inspired is what I thought. I had to get it. It just stood out to me. Hellboy in Hell number 10. Mike Mignola. It was really difficult to choose a Mike Mignola piece of art uh, to symbolize what I enjoyed about him. But of course, we're talking the contrast, right? Again, the black and whites and the use of shadows. He's a master at it. And I'm cover right there maybe i have a thing for just black white and red and some gray tones maybe it's just me i love that freaking cover uh is it spoiling anything not really i mean you know he does covers for hellboy that have nothing to do with the inside of the book and sometimes yeah a lot of the covers you're seeing here especially in the by the time we get to the early odds they have nothing to do with the books at all the internal stories or anything so, oh yeah, Mike Mignola, that piece. I came really close to picking the Mike Mignola piece. Uh, what was it? Was a uh, it was the, uh, the the cover to one of the early Hellboys, but I went with this one instead because something else beat it out that particular year. I can't believe I, I don't have any Arthur Adams. How I came really close to picking that Arthur Adams New Mutants cover where it's the White Queen. It's inked by Bill Sienkiewicz. It's a very very awesome unique piece. Aliens, Dead Orbit, number one. Now, I went with this one because big fan of the Aliens franchise, and this is where I fell in love with James Stoko. I loved his artwork in this, and I became a huge fan because of this, and I've been following him, whether it's Godzilla, whether his own, own independent stuff, I have been following his artwork, and this is the book. This one is so freaking good, and if You've never read it, it will be in the fourth omnibus of the original years, the one that Marvel is printing out or putting out. But that cover of the Xenomorph just kind of melting or, or falling apart, rather. And if you've seen the Alien movies, you've seen that happen a lot. But oh man, the detail, the insane, insane amount of detail in that. Batgirl 23, the Joshua Middleton cover. Now I went with this cover because I fell in love with Joshua Middleton's artwork during his run on NYX. It had this very cartoony anime style to it. His art has changed a lot. It's, it's almost become almost photorealistic in a way. But this right here is a good mashup of his old art style and his new art style. It's a side profile of uh, Barbara Gordon Batgirl, because of course this is during the Rebirth era, I believe. We moved on to the Rebirth era. And it's just a beautiful absolutely gorgeous piece and you can see the kind of painted style that he has he is a wonderful artist and i wish he still did more stuff on the inside so internal art books or artwork strike force number one in 2019 but the john tyler christopher cover i met john tyler christopher at a convention in 2018 or uh, yeah it was 2018 and he was drawing these mock-up covers for for poison ivy and rogue and and then when I saw this cover, I had to go and find him at the next convention and I had to get him. It is just so perfect. Uh, anyway, that, okay, that has yellow, so that doesn't count as the white, black, and red and gray tones. But it's Spider Woman on the cover. This is a variant cover again of Strike Force. He is a part of Strike Force. Uh, now he's done several covers like this. He's not just done ladies, he's also done Wolverine, for example. But if you ever find him at a convention, this piece is worth owning in a big uh, poster size format it is a beautiful piece and i know recently he's probably known for his toy variants but no that is the cover that is the freaking cover of jessica drew as spider woman wow that that is beautiful we are in 2020 so we're almost done we're at the basket full of heads number seven cover but i went with the gabriel rodriguez cover I was a big fan of Rodriguez's artwork in Joe Hill's uh, Lock and Key, and this cover is what I love about him. He has a good mix of just horror 
and anime, like a cartoony feel to it. Kind of like Nick Bradshaw meets a little bit of Arthur Adams and you throw some blood in there. And I can't believe this is the only horror comic that I have in this entire list. So maybe next year, 46 years, 46 covers, I'll do more horror. I don't, I get, I'm a huge uh, comic horror fan, so why didn't I add any in here? So anyway, but that one for sure. That is again, the variant. And a couple of these are, actually, I think the rest of these are, they have nothing to do with the stories, I'm sure. Amazing Spider-Man 55, the Patrick Gleason cover. This is what started that whole webbing cover. They've done variants of it, like with the blue and then the red, but the original, again, black and white. Oh my gosh, that webbing and, and it's making his head later on. I think they did a Venom, they did a Eddie Brock cover, and it is the variant to the Spider-Man by Dick Spencer Omnibus Volume 2. And that is the cover to get. I think he did a Carnage one too. But that, oh, that is such an awesome cover. Sandman Universe Nightmare Country. Now, I went with Nightmare Country, number one, but the Jenny Frizen cover. She's another one of these wonderful cover artists. She's done a lot of covers for Red Sonja. She's done a lot of covers of DC. Death being one of my favorite characters. Who that... Who that had read Sandman and loved Sandman did not fall in love with the character of Death. And that cover, oh, it's so beautiful. Especially if you know the skull she's holding. Even if you haven't read it and you've watched this TV show, the Netflix series, that skull. And she's just such a wonderful cover artist. I love her stuff. And that cover, let me tell you, it was near impossible to find because I tried to find it for the Astonishing Melanie, no go. And to wrap up my list of 45 years, 45 covers, Sins of Sinister number one, the Art Germ variant with the White Queen. I don't know why I'm pointing there. I don't know where these pictures are gonna be with the White Queen, Emma Frost. As my good friend, the Omni Dog would say, yowza, oh my gosh. Sins of who? X-Men what? Who cares? I'm in. Is she in this book? Wow. Look at that cape. Oh my gosh, look at those boots. Those big long boots. Oh my gosh, the White Queen. After all these years. I think that's the only White Queen on the cover I put. So, And yes, I try to limit myself to how many X-Men titles I would put in there. All right. Now these books can be found in collected editions. And those collected editions can be bought from our sponsors. If you're in Europe and you're interested in buying these books, definitely check out Walt's Comic Shop in Berlin, Germany. They have the cheapest pre-order prices, flat shipping rate of 12 euros for all EU countries, emails answered within 24 hours, waltzcomicshop.com, and you can use the code near mint condition at checkout and get free shipping for all EU countries with your first order over 40 euros. That's Walt's Comic Shop, your reliable source for omnis and premium collected editions in Europe. Ding! This episode is brought to you by CheapGraphicNovels.com, your online home for graphic novels and collected editions up to 50% off cover price. They have excellent shipping and prompt and helpful service. Check out their bargain deals for up to 90% off cover price. And don't forget that CGN also takes pre-orders. That way you don't miss out on the hottest releases. And they are currently running a special promotion for you Minties. If you're a first time customer, after receiving your order confirmation email, reply back to that email and let them know Near Mint Condition sent you their way. They will then apply a free shipping promotional credit to your next order in the US. Cheap Graphic Novels, your source for the hottest books with the kind of deep discount, quality shipping, and customer service that will keep you coming back for more. Now that was my list. 45 years old today. 45 covers. I hope you enjoyed this. Let me know in the comments down below if you enjoyed this type of video. Maybe I can make some more later on um, and not have to wait until I'm 46 to do 46 covers. So it's a little bit different than what I normally do, but I wanted to try something a little different for my birthday. So that's it, everyone. If you share the birthday with me, though, March 14th, right? Eyes of March, right? Beware the eyes of March. Uh, let me know in the comments down below. Pie, whatever the hell it is. Um, thank you again to our patrons for making videos like this possible. Thank you to my buddy Keenan. You know what you did. Everyone, stay healthy and safe out there. Much love. <laughs>